Okay, so I've got a bit of a good story, but it's actually a bad story here, okay? So some of you may be aware uh, that some people are homeless. A tragedy, I know. Actually, quite a few people are homeless. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has a lot of homeless people in it. Um, I don't know if there's some specific set of conditions that led to that. Wait, what am I talking about? Yes, I do. Reagan closed all the mental health facilities in California years ago, and all the people who were shacked up in there ended up getting bus tickets and sent off to... Okay, sorry, I answered my own question there. It was stupid. If, if I cared, I'd re-record, but I'm not going to. That's the authenticity that you come from, uh, you know, that you get from me. <clears throat> London's homeless will be offered two-week stay in hotel over Christmas with three <coughs> meals a day and festive Zoom quiz starring Imelda Staunton and Ellie Golding on December 25th. So that was a sentence. Um, I'm going to ignore everything here because I don't know who these people are. I assume they're British. I don't care. I'm ignoring all of this. I don't care. Now, I'm going to be a little critical here because this sounds like a feel-good story. You know, all the homeless people are being offered two weeks in a hotel. It's a pretty long time. Um, and three meals a day. <clears throat> but, excuse me for the cough, my apologies. But there is an underlying story here, I think, that's a lot more pessimistic. So, I just want to say, uh, right off the bat, this is being organized by a homelessness charity called Crisis. And no shade on them. This is in no way meant to be critical of them. What they're doing is lovely. I love them. I'm sure they would love me too. Uh, the British. And... I don't fault them at all for what they're doing. The reason they're doing this is because the traditional um, way they would help the homeless around Christmas time would be to use these large-scale dormitories, and they're not doing that because of COVID-19. You know, hotel rooms are all isolated, one room per person or whatever. So they're going with that. And great to them. You know, they bought like hundreds of hotel rooms for these people to use, and I think that's wonderful. However, there is something about this that is very sort of latently sinister. Again, none of this is about crisis. None of this is about the actual people doing it. It's about the conditions behind it. So I don't like charity very much because every dollar that goes to charity feels like a very inefficient way of subsidizing something that should be a government program. If you give to charity a hundred bucks and it goes to homeless people or whatever, that hundred bucks, that shouldn't be going to a charity. That should be being paid in taxes where the government could then implement institutions to address these problems at a systemic level. The issue is that charities typically only address the surface issue. They'll feed people, they'll clothe people, they'll house people. What leads to people needing to be fed, clothed, and housed. Can a charity fix the opioid crisis? Well, no, it can't. A charity can help people who are overdosing or help them get clean needles or whatever, and that's good work. Nothing but respect to the people who are doing that. But government regulation is what we need to cut down on the opioid crisis. That's the step right there. But a charity can't do that. A charity cleans up messes. It doesn't prevent them from happening. And that's the position we find ourselves in right now. So some home, few hundred hotel rooms have been bought. Fantastic. Homeless people get three warm meals a day. They get to stay inside. That's great. But normally, this charity crisis, they would use large dormitories. Now, I'm not familiar with the means by which they acquire these dormitories. I don't know if they rent them or if they have them all the time. Um, and they've just not been able to use them this year because of COVID. I don't know. But it feels weird to me that the solution to this problem is to defer to the comparatively extremely expensive practice of buying hotel rooms for people. That is a very inefficient way of addressing homelessness. Like, can you imagine how many homeless people are there in America? It's like a third to a half a million, I think. Imagine like, all right, we're going to fix this. Buy everyone a hotel room. 
Well, great for the homeless people. Hotel rooms can be awfully comfy. Phenomenal for the hotel industry. And it makes me wonder about the ways in which we provide charity through just subsidizing corporate profits. Like, imagine if there's an indigenous community, you know, and the indigenous community struggles because it doesn't have access to clean water. There's a river that runs through, but that river's polluted because of like a factory and like, you know, the local legislators aren't doing shit about it. The, not exactly an unheard of story. And then a charity is like, okay, we got this, people. And they go out and they buy 40,000 Dasani water bottles. And they bring them in on a big truck. And they're like, here you go, people. Now you can bathe and drink for a while. And it's true. Now the indigenous people can bathe and drink for a while. And Dasani, you know, rolls away with the wheelbarrow full of money. The hotel industry, they roll away with the wheelbarrow full of money. Or like, homeless people need food. Well, what do you do? You buy them a bunch of McDonald's, right? Or maybe, maybe, maybe Cheesecake Factory, you know, you go, you go even higher with it. But we're not fixing the underlying problem. And the issue that I have is the more you depart from fixing the systemic issue, the more inefficient your use of money is. You know how there's all this, uh, you probably saw the commercials maybe when you were younger and it was like, for one quarter a day, you can feed some kid in Africa. And it's true, you know, the cost of feeding a human being at a very like subsistence level is actually very, very, very low. The, the grain and like the, the, the base subsidies, the flour and the eggs and the milk, you can feed a human being for very, very little. Now, of course, I live in a city in America, so if I wanted to feed myself um, without using any subsistence foods, by just going to restaurants, I could easily feed myself off of like 60 to to $100 a day, depending on where I'm getting my food from. If I eat frugally, if I only eat from like fast food joints, then I could feed myself 15 to 20 bucks a day. But that's still one or two orders of magnitude higher than the absolute baseline level of feeding a person per day. And maybe my food would taste better than their food, sure. And I have fat quicker. But the point that I'm getting at here is that when you have problems like homelessness or when you have problems like starvation or thirst, different approaches are bring with them different levels of material efficiency, you know? Um, buying a bunch of Dasani water bottles is much less cost efficient than it would be to simply invest in the infrastructure to provide that indigenous community access to clean water the same way that I have in my house with like uh, pipes. Now, of course, in the short term, it'd be more expensive to invest in that infrastructure. But America's not going anywhere. You know, the land we're on is pretty much a permanent fixture of the planet Earth. I'd say investing in infrastructure to connect people who are disconnected, generally a pretty worthwhile endeavor. Or if it's a very small community and you don't want to run pipes all the way out there, fix the damn river. Clean it up. Then you fix your problem right there. These are systemic solutions. They require policy and political power. And political power, remember, politics is all about power. Power is all about violence. Political power is all about threatening people with consequences if they don't do X. If I don't pay my taxes, I go to jail. If a factory, you know, executives dump into the river against the law, then they could go to jail, except in practice they never do. They just pay fines that are 1.2% of their yearly revenue, and it's nothing. But different approaches have different levels of efficiency, you know. Homelessness being a very big one. Homelessness costs us quite a bit. It costs us culturally and socially. It comes at a great cost to the people who are homeless. And it costs us financially as well. If you want to look at it in a purely like Machiavellian, hyper, um, hyper capitalistic way, then you can think of the homeless people in this country as a labor resource that can't be fully taken advantage of because they don't have the material necessities available to them that would allow them to become efficient, productive workers. Same reason you want people to be educated, right? If for no other reason, you know, if you ignore the cultural, social, and ethical elements of it, if nothing else, People getting educated means they can do high-tech jobs, and that makes the country richer. There's no argument against um, empowering the homeless or dealing with starvation or dealing with lack of access to water. It's just about how we address it. And sometimes charities make me really uncomfortable because I don't know where that money is really going. 
how much of it is getting eaten up by the charity itself. Okay, we'll say it's a very, very respectable charity. You know, say it's a very decent charity and, the, you know, they run very, very, um, you know, very cutthroat. They don't take a bunch of money for themselves. Fine. And there are charities like that. Okay. Um, then how are the charities providing those resources? Because if they're just buying food or buying water from commercial outlets, then who's making the money? Will it be the food or the water outlets? If they're buying hotel rooms, then who's making that money? The hotel industry. And isn't that all just such an inefficient way, and such a convenient way, too, for these business owners, to address systemic problems? You know? It's like, um, you know, a lot of conspiracy theorists, they'll say, like, they have the cure to cancer, they just don't want to give it to you because, uh, um, because it's more expensive to sell you the treatment than it would be to sell you the cure, so they make more money off of it. And I don't believe that. I don't think that the cancer cure is being hidden from us because nobody, keeping secrets is impossible at a high enough level. And the number of people involved in creating a cure for cancer would be astronomical, would be huge. But the logic, the underlying logic is the same. And I personally would rather money go towards regulations on the pharmaceutical industry or towards lobbying for that than I would money going towards, what is it called, Narcan? That's like the anti-overdose thing or any number of sort of post-tragedy cleanup tools that you could use. Look, I'm rambling here a little bit. I think this is a lovely thing. The homeless people get to sleep in the hotels, you know, they get the food, but then what comes after that, you know? They go back on the streets, they go back to panhandling for food or, you know, whatever their individual circumstances call for, and we're back at square one. Nothing's really been fixed. We just temporarily alleviated the problem. So no shade to um, the crisis charity, no shade to charities in general. Um, just it's important to consider when looking to address a problem, how much are you really fixing it? How efficient is the dollar invested to outcome ratio? And who's really benefiting from this method of fixing this problem, if it, is, if it even is fixing it, you know? Just something to consider. It's something that I learned about and thought about a lot when I was in university because many of my um, you know, peers did work with local volunteering orgs as well as I did myself. And you really have to wonder about you know, what the material incentives are behind certain ways of addressing social problems. Anyway, rant over. Go, get, go, go, 